chapter 28, entitled Process as Meaning, colon, Bach and the Few. And this is our first chapter in our uh, genre uh, coverage of absolute music. Remember the reverse side, uh, two types of music, program music, where the music tells a story, uh, or absolute music where there is no story and it's just about the music. Now let's open up the PowerPoint. Chapter 28. Uh, so this starts in the Baroque. And of course, we could categorize music that was from the Middle Ages or Renaissance and say that it was um, absolute music. But this is the first chapter in the textbook where I'm uh, identifying it as uh, solely absolute music. And so it says the organ and the harpsichord were the main keyboard instruments of the Baroque era. So remember the Baroque era is 1600 to 1750. And what happened in 1600? The invention of, yes, opera. And 1750, what happened in 1750? Yes, the death of J.S. Bach. So, um, organ and a harpsichord. This is before the piano. Piano was barely being invented uh, in the 1730s. And by the time that Mozart died in 1791, the piano was just starting to be a functional instrument. And uh, then by the 1820s, it's uh, a dominant instrument and music being written for virtuoso piano players. But at this time, a Bach, the piano is not a primary instrument. It's the organ and the harpsichord. So keyboard players improvised and created free form pieces called preludes or toccatas, followed by more structured works as fugues. And uh, frequently music is coupled. I put a prelude in the fugue or a toccata in the fugue or a prelude to a suite, right? Beginning of the suite. But prelude is typically improvisatory in nature. And Bach did improvise uh, and was famous for improvising. And we're gonna sample music from uh, one of his last works called The Art of the Fugue, uh, last and most comprehensive example of contrapuntal writing. When we say contrapuntal, we meaning it's counterpoint, meaning you write with um, a few notes, and then as a composer, then before going on, you say, oh, I'm gonna write another line that coordinates with that and complements it. And so you, you write point and then counterpoint. That's exactly what that means. Just to review texture, right? Refers to how many melodies are simultaneously present in a given section of music and how those melodies are related to one another. Remember we had monophony, Polyphony and homophony. What do those mean? Right? Monophonic consists of a single unaccompanied melody, one sound, one melody at a time. Homophonic, there's one principal melody, but there's a more musical lines that there support that one music line. Most of the music we listen to is homophonic. There's a melody and there's a bass and keyboard and drums. It's all to support that one melody, maybe a singer or maybe a a solo instrument. And polyphonic texture is where the key word is poly, right? More than one at the same time. The music lines are written to be equals and not one dominating over the other and performed simultaneously. And then when we talk about polyphony, there's two kinds of polyphony. There's the imitative polyphony and non-imitative polyphony. Well, imitative polyphony, uh, where the parts imitate each other. No wonder they call it imitative polyphony. And then they, they overlap, right? We're gonna hear a lot of that. And of course, non-imitative polyphony like, uh, well, the Renaissance had a lot of non-imitative polyphony with the voice, the vocal parts. So in regards to musical form, right? The form determines the overall expressive content of a piece of instrumental music. And what is that? It's how the sections are related 
to one another. I always refer to it, it means the form is the sectional relation. Oh, let me plug this in, just take it a second. So form, right? This is very important. And we're talking about instrumental music. In vocal music, right, the poem, the words are really what determines the form and the structure. Are there verses uh, or is it or not, right? And then instrumental music, what can you do as a composer? Well, you write something, you can repeat it. You could vary it, change it a little bit. You could do something completely different. Or you could take it and then use what you've written and just kind of develop it. We call that development section. So we hear a lot of the in instrumental music, repetition, variation, contrast, and development. So uh, vocal music is bounded by the words where instrumental music has no bounds. In a fugue, and that's the main form we're gonna talk about here, is uh, it starts with an exposition. And uh, the subject is presented with an answer, right? And then there are episodes where there is no subject. So uh, in a fugue, you, they have these rules, right? So when you have a subject that's presented, it's usually by itself, and we refer to uh, the parts in a fugue as the voices, even though there, we're not talking about the human voice, we just talk about musical lines and refer to the, the, the same thing as in human vo voices, we have se soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. The same thing in instrumental music for a fugue, we re refer to those parts as a soprano, alto, and tenor, and bass. So they have one of these rules that states when a voice comes in, the next voice to come in you know, it can only be the, the next higher or the next lower voice. So if you start with the soprano, the only other voice that can come in next is the alto, because the bass would not be close to the soprano. Or if you start with the bass, you could go to the alto, but you couldn't go bass to soprano. Or if you start with the alto voice, you could actually go up to the soprano, or you could go down to the bass part next. So again, the two uh, instruments are the organ and the harpsichord. And the har harpsichord, you look at it and say, oh, it looks like a piano, but it's not a piano because it's, the, other than the keyboard, um, the mechanism is completely different. In a harpsichord, <clears throat> when you push a key, it has a hook that grabs the string and it plucks it. <clears throat> and then this, the tone is not very sustained, it dies immediately. And then, so, you can't play loud or soft. It's just no matter how hard you push the key, it's the same loudness. Although sometimes they have two keyboards and they'll simply say it's two manuals, meaning that actually there's two sets of mechanisms and one will pluck the string in one place and the other keyboard will pluck the string in another place. So you can effectively have two levels of dynamics. The one would be plucking and you say, oh, that's, fine and you play the other one now, now we have contrast it's plucked in a different place and a different quality of sound and um, a uh, different volume and of course the organ is a wind instrument uh, a giant machine I always say it's a it's the, it's the first synthesizer and there have been simple organs going all the way back and of course an accordion is a kind of an organ organ has pipes and the air has to go through uh, you push the key, it releases the mechanism, and, and then the air goes through the pipes and makes the sound. So J.S. Bach was a famous organist. That was his instrument. And he was asked uh, frequently to travel to great distances to uh, um, install an organ for a church and regulate it and make sure it was tuned properly and ready to play. And, of course, then he would play the organ and then... Um, people would be amazed that not only was he a technician, but he could improvise uh, amazing fugues and, and preludes and toccatas on the, on the organ. So again, these are uh, kind of improvised sounding pieces and 
you know, person would write that down. And a fugue <clears throat> is much more structured. Here is a giant organ, right? A spectacular Baroque organ from 1738 in St. Bavo's Cathedral in the Netherlands. Wow, what a mammoth instrument. So the fugue uh, and its devices, again, we say it's contrapuntal and it's polyphonic. So you have your different music lines. You start with a subject, which is stated. And then uh, the subject is stated again by another voice. So the first voice enters and states the subject. Then there's an answer, which is um, a response. And so this goes on at the same time. And then, uh, actually, this is called the, the exposition of the few, where all these, the subject and the answer are presented. And then there are sections of the, of the few where the subject is not being presented at all, which is transitional material, we call that episodes. And then we're gonna talk about the different uh, contrapuntal devices that a composer would use uh, in the standard way and to this day, right? Augmentation, diminution, retrograde, inversion, and stretto. Uh, actually, we already did sample some fugue music from the text in Handel's Messiah and his choruses. There's a lot of fugues that he uses. So in vocal music, you can have fugues as well. And then in the Bach cantata, Bach it off, there's uh, the opening movement is actually a, uh, a fugue. And then later, and the last piece we're going to list for this absolute music is from chapter 11, I think. And it's, uh, we haven't listened to it, but The Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra uh, by Benjamin Britten, written in the 20th century, which really is variations and fugue on the theme of Henry Purcell. Here is a painting that is um, a visual of interlocking, interlocking and parallel lines resemble, resemble the polyphonic textures of the fugue, right? Actually, the painting is called Fugue. All right, let me play uh, these music examples just so you can see what we're talking about. First of all, uh, in this example, it shows this melody and it's highlighted in blue and that's the subject. And, uh, you know. And then the answer would be the same thing, but shift it up, right? Actually, not exactly the same, right? Together we have polyphony. So let me see if I can execute this. This is that same subject that I've just played, and they're showing you the, the uh, methods used to alter that. So now I, I could play that same melody upside down. Now, would the listener be able to hear this? I kind of doubt it, right? <laughs> upside down would be starting from note and just doing the up. This goes up, this one goes down. This goes down, this goes up. So it's just the, the inverted. Can you tell that's the inversion? I don't think so. The retrograde would be the same thing backwards. So here we end with the fast notes. This starts with the fast notes and it just goes backwards, really, retrograde. And guess what? Let's do it upside down and backwards. How about if we stretch it out, call it augmentation? Or 
How about if we compress it? Call it diminution. These are the techniques the composer would use. So um, Bach, being expert at fugues, he wrote uh, two music books called The Well-Tempered Clavier. The clavier is a keyboard instrument. Well, it's a type of a harpsichord, actually. And uh, remember, at this time in the Baroque is when we say that modern music starts because of three things, because we have a standardized tuning, because we start to use a major minor scales, and, uh, and modern instruments start to be developed, okay? Uh, which are different than the Renaissance. This is the Baroque period. So there are 12 notes on a piano, which you play all the white keys and the black keys. And the 13th is the same name as whatever you started with. And uh, you could have a um, tonal center in each one of those notes. So you could have 12 keys. But you can also have a major key and a minor key. So you can actually have 12 major keys and 12 minor keys. And, and you have, uh, that's all you would have, right? 24 different possibilities as far as major and minor keys on the, on the keyboard. And now that equal temperament or standardized tuning where the notes are equally apart based on mathematics instead of using a tuning system based on nature, uh, because before, when it was used on nature, you started to play black keys, and the more black keys you played, the more out of tune it sounded. So with the equal temperament system, you could play in all the keys, or any place on the keyboard, and you wouldn't notice it was uh, out of tune. So since this was possible, I could see that Bach, you know, saying to his wife, uh, you know, Martha, I'm going to write a prelude and fugue in every key. And he did. And then he wrote another book of the same thing. So 24 preludes and fugues. And then another book of 24 preludes and fugues. Actually, 48 pieces and 48 pieces. Um, two years ago, for the El Prasso Pro Musica, a lady was here and she played all of book one, the 24 preludes and fugues. Quite a phenomenon, completely by memory. So uh, the last piece, or one of the last works that Bach wrote was um, The Art of the Fugue. And he really didn't say that it's for this instrument or that instrument, it was just written out. So you'll hear The Art of the Fugue performed on many different types of, uh, uh, of instruments, solo instruments and combinations of, of flutes or trombones or, or whatever, uh, brass ensembles. And uh, we're gonna sample the piece called Contrapunctus Number no. One, and actually the art of the fugue consists of 14 fugues and four canons. A canon is a type of a fugue, and it's a, a kind of the uh, ultimate example of writing fugues. Here is a, a harpsichord. Notice it's black keys and white keys. Uh, here is a visual showing a subject and then the answer and then this would be an episode with new material. Oh, over here the episode, right? So the subject, the answer, subject. Okay, let's sample this uh, piece of music by Bach. Oh, more information. So the fugue is the single most representative musical procedure form to emerge from the Baroque era as it epitomizes the Baroque genius for melodic extravagance and systematic organization and control. So once again, um, you really have one, one theme in a, uh, in a fugue. So we say it's monothematic. And then that theme is called the subject. Again, the exposition where you have the subject and the answer presented, and then episodes where you have no subject or answer being stated.
Here we go. Uh, and this performed on organ. Uh, take note uh, the requirements for the individual to perform this and how much is played with the feet. If you look at the pedals that he pushes with his feet, uh, foot, feet, and is, is, uh, it, it's set up like the keyboard, right? Two rows, a row of white, white keys and a row of black, although they're not colored. Here we go. Contrapunctus number one by Bach. Just to summarize that uh, a fugue is polyphony, and you could have a whole movement or a piece of music be called a fugue and written in that technique, or you could just have a passage or a section in a piece of music that is fugal. So that concludes chapter 28, Bach and the Fugue.